Hello, everybody, and welcome back uh, to our afternoon session. I would ask you again to uh, please turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent and uh, take your seats. Our afternoon session today begins with a keynote address from Dr. Bill Kassan of the London School of Economics. The chair for this session is Dr. Richard Bekelligat of Dundalk Institute of Technology. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, and again, as the old saying going, goes, our keynote here today is someone who really needs no introduction, especially for those of us who have studied the history of the Irish Civil War and Civil War history in general over the last 20 years. Uh, Dr. Bill Kassan, he received his BA and MA in Trinity uh, College Dublin before moving to London to complete his complete his PhD in the London School of Economics. Today, he holds the role of Associate Professor in Politics in the London School of Economics. He has a particular research interest in Civil War history and post-conflict reconstruction. And of course, as many of you would know, he has published several acclaimed works on the topic, including The Politics of the Irish Civil War, which was produced by the Oxford University Press in 2005. In 2014, he wrote After Civil War, Division, Reconstruction and Reconciliation in Contemporary Europe, that was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. And his most recent book in 2016, uh, was Nations Torn Asunder, The Challenge of Civil War, again with Oxford University Press. Dr. Kassan's keynote address for us today is entitled The Geography of the Civil War, Kerry and Beyond, and I am really looking forward to it. So take it away, Dr. Kassan. Thanks very much for the introduction. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, I thank Owen, Bridget and Mary for the invitation to come over from London to speak at this conference. Um, as it's just been said, I, I published a book in 2005 called The Politics of the Irish Civil War. Um, after 13 years, I must say it's nice to come back into fashion. <laughs> if I'm writing a book at the moment, I think I can target 2040 for another busy year. But in, in terms of the way I approached the Irish Civil War in 2005, the politics of the Civil War invariably raised questions of the treaty, constitutional issues, relations with Britain, and particularly the personalities of Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins. And because of these dominant personalities and the fact that they weren't really very different in terms of how they saw the world, very often, the Irish Civil War has been seen through a very personal prism as a conflict that was fought between people who were close, personally, close to each other, and written maybe in a way that is a little bit top-down. So to give you an example, if you went to the National Library in Dublin and you typed in titles with Eamon de Valera in it and titles with Michael Collins in it, you'd get over 400 titles. Really amazing, as if the way we should understand our civil war is through the medium of biography, primarily. Now, my book was called The Politics of the Irish Civil War, but as you can see, um, the title of my talk is called The Geography of the Irish Civil War, and nothing could be less personal, more impersonal than geography. And by looking at its geography, I wonder whether we can shed some light on three things. Why this conflict didn't last very long. Secondly, why it was one-sided. And thirdly, did it really favor one side as opposed to the other? Now, I wouldn't say geography in itself explains all of these things, but in combination, it might explain something. And in this lecture, I will make the case. The first thing to realize, though, because there might seem to be an element of inevitability about the outcome when I talk about the role of geography in the Irish Civil War, the first thing to beware in mind is that hindsight is an easy thing. Now consider, for example, the source, that is, the letters written by General Neville Macready, commander of the British Army in Ireland in the spring and summer of 1922. He was writing back constantly to London about the Irish situation. And you'll all probably know that he didn't want to reinvade Ireland. He thought the provisional government should clamp down on the IRA in the four courts. 
and he believed that the provisional government was objectively in a good position to win whatever fighting would ensue. When you look more closely, after the anti-treatyites had been evicted, if you want, from the four courts and from the centre of Dublin, he thought they did a reasonably good job for such an inexperienced army with no proper officer class. A week later, however, on July the 8th, he wrote back to London that this couldn't be guaranteed when it came to evicting the IRA from its strongholds in rural Ireland. And he wrote that with the exception of Clare, the authority of the provisional government in Connacht and Munster is, quote unquote, practically non-existent. So it's important to realize that for someone like McCready, when you're talking about how any putate of Irish government could actually assert its authority, you have to consider the question of geography. He himself, as I said, was relatively sanguine about the possibility that the provisional government would win the civil war. They were in objectively a good position. I agree with that, and with some qualification, I'll make that case with the lecture. Now, firstly, when we talk about geography, what is geography? I'll talk about geography in a number of ways in this lecture. The first way we can think of geography, even when you're driving around Kerry, is geography is something like a lake or a mountain, something that is relatively permanent, an unchanging aspect of the physical environment. Now, from this perspective, we can look at um, Ireland, and we can look at this particular map. You can see, of course, that John Dorney this morning um, produced a map that I have to confess was aesthetically more pleasing than the one I'm showing, but that doesn't mean mine one won't be equally informative. Now, what would you say about this particular map from the point of view of politics? A number of things stand out. Firstly, the historical prominence of Dublin as a capital, which went back to medieval times. Secondly, you would say the small size of the state. If you were in Athlone in 1922, the distance to Dublin would be less than 70 miles, the distance to Cork would be just over 100 miles, to Donegal on the coast, 86 miles, to Galway, only 47 miles. So these are, for a government that was soon to command the centre of the country, small distance over which they would have to project power. So the small size of the state is important. Then you had, which is not shown on the map, across the Midlands in Ireland from Dublin to Galway, military installations, barracks, jails, Beggar's Bush Barracks in Dublin, Mountjoy Jail, Portobello Barracks, then in the Midlands, the Corro and Athlone, and then, of course, you had the, 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 the base in Tume in Galway. So there already was, when the Civil War began, a chain of military installations in the centre of the country on the basis of which the provisional government could hope to dominate the country. And then we had, of course, the border that is there with Northern Ireland, which is still here today. And, of course, this was a relatively secure border for two reasons, I think. Firstly, most IRA men who left Northern Ireland between 1920 and 1922 opted to support the free state, and many of them became part of the officer class. And secondly, of course, by the second week of August 1922, there was peace agreed between the provisional government in Dublin and their northern counterparts in Belfast. So the border was important, I suppose, for those reasons. From the IRA's point of view, of course, it meant that there was no sanctuary beyond the border. So if they were going to survive in the guerrilla phase of the Civil War, they wouldn't be able to use Northern Ireland in any territorial way. So the first thing I want to say, and I should admit here, because some of this might seem a little bit technical and too impersonal to you, I am by training a political science scientist. I'm, I, I do a lot of historical work, but I'm not really a historian. And political scientists probably use language and think of things a little bit differently to historians. And so what I'm essentially looking at are what are the objective characteristics of the Irish Free State that might explain the type of questions I discussed when I introduced my talk? But I do believe these factors favoured the provisional government 
and the National Army. So to take, for example, the size of the state, the Irish Free State as a territory was big enough for the IRA to stage a controlled retreat to Connacht and Munster in the summer of 1922, but it was not so big that they could keep themselves beyond the reach of the state for very long. What they had to do, and I think John Dorney mentioned this in his presentation today, was to think of a military strategy that wasn't about gaining territory. They couldn't hold territory because they hadn't sufficient weaponry. How did they keep themselves beyond the state? They, they formed themselves into flying columns and waged guerrilla war. What they couldn't do is exploit the territory of the state in such a way that they could develop alternative power centers, develop relations with a supportive population, tax people, and so forth, generate resources for their military campaign. Their main tactic was to make the country ingovernable. By destroying its physical infrastructure and transport links, they hoped to basically to weary down, to wear down the provisional government. And I think this, this, this was really something that was taken very seriously. I think it was a main part of their insurgency. And even in the part of Ireland I'm from, which is Wexford, um, I, re I was watching recently on the web uh, a study that was done by a group of archaeologists, and you, you probably know that Wexford was more active in the Civil War than it had been in the War of Independence. And when I looked at these archaeological maps, it was really amazing how lethally destructive a small IRA based in South County Wexford was in the course of the Civil War. I think they destroyed something like 60 bridges. But it could have been the same here. And to give you an example of that about Kerry, just, I came across just by accident a few weeks ago an article that was written on the 25th of January 1923 called Deadly Attacks on the Irish Railway. And it said, a large force of Republicans invest, invaded Castlemaine, County Kerry, at 8 o'clock yesterday morning and laid siege to the military post. The attack lasted for two hours but was eventually beaten off. The Republicans burnt the railway station and blew up the bridge over the River Main, thus isolating Milltown, Kilorglin, and the whole area as far as Cahar Sivin from Tralee, the food distributing centre for the neighbourhood. It is reported that a trench mortar was used by the attacker and that four Republicans were killed. The national forces lost one man dead. And then the article ended, appeal for recruits to army and to employers giving them leave, desperately needed. The point is that this was a serious part of the war. Whether you regard it as some historians do, a policy born in criminal desperation, or whether it was a potentially effective strategy that was rational in the circumstances of the war, that's an interesting debate. I think what I'm trying to say is given the imbalance of power in terms of territory and all these factors I'm talking about, they couldn't hold on to territory, so this was a tactic that made sense with that in mind. Now a second perspective on territory is to see geography not as a fixed thing, but as a resource that can be manipulated by actors in the course of a war. And this is a perspective that I think people in the Irish army themselves would be happy with. And they would believe that the Irish army in the Civil War had certain advantages vis-a-vis -vis its opponents. It was armed by Britain, for example, but they can also take credit for having exploited these advantages. And the classic example is, of course, the naval landings which took place in the early weeks of the conventional Civil War. This is represented on the map, um, and you can see that line going from Limerick in the west all the way to Watford, and then below that in Cork, Kerry, and then further north, you can see the places by which Emmett Dalton got the National Army to land um, by sea. And this, of course, was a classic counter-maneuver that was proven very, very successful at the time. And it had a number of consequences because it was an alternative, firstly, to facing up to the IRA where the IRA was strongest. Secondly, 
it broke up lines of communication between IRA brigades in the west, southwest, in the west, and in the northwest. Thirdly, it effectively forced the IRA to fall back on guerrilla war, and Liam Lynch on the 19th of August more or less ordered them to do so. They were doing it anyway. And lastly, it gave the opportunity for the National Army to do what was really crucial in a territorial sense, which is dominate territory. Now, the important thing about the domination of territory is not necessarily militarily. What I think mattered is that it gave a huge advantage to the provisional government and the army in the information war they were waging against the IRA. Now, you probably all know that the provisional government had the strong backing of the Catholic Church. You also know that the national newspapers, for the most part, were censored, but also strong supporters in any case. Insofar as we can read into the 1922 election, there wasn't strong electoral support for the anti-Republican position. So the information war was already tilted in the direction, in the favor of the provisional government. But nonetheless, territorial dominance was very important because if you imagine what it was actually like in the context of, let's say, September, October, November 1922, the National Army was in control of most of the urban centers and towns in the state. This meant that the IRA were essentially living in rural Ireland, on the run. They may, may occasionally come to a town to, to make raids for provisions and goods, but in that context, it became very easy for the provisional government to represent itself as the protector of life and property, as the power that would return the country to normality, and also to represent the IRA as essentially a group of people that were irresponsible, unrepresentative, and through this collapse or this attack on the infrastructure, an organization that was in a way waging a war on its own country. And I think this information war, I mean, you'll all be familiar with this term, irregular, the way in which the, the Dublin government, but also the media, referred to the IRA throughout the Civil War as the irregulars. They also referred to them as mutineers. They referred to them as anarchists and criminals. There was this process of othering taking place. And I think one of the things you can say about how the provisional government, you know, this idea of geography being a resource that can be manipulated by actors in a war, they used their territorial dominance to win this information war in a major way. And I think this is important in terms of how we understand what happened in Ireland in 1922, because if you looked at it in a cold-blooded way, you would say that what had happened in Ireland during the War of Independence was that because British power was basically compromised and collapsed, a kind of power vacuum had developed in the society. The treaty made it worse in the sense that the two wings of Sinn Féin of the IRA of Common Amman couldn't agree on how they would actually rectify this situation of there being a lack of power, a power vacuum. But I think one of the things that happened is that the provisional government proved very, very effective in terms of actually filling this power vacuum, at least, I suppose, beyond 1924. But what I mean about this being very important is that it has a bearing on how we see the Civil War. Do we see the Civil War in the sense that Brendan Clifford said it was in a pamphlet as the conflict that forms the state? Or can we think of it differently and ask the question, well, you know, generally there have been maybe 130 new states created in the 20th century. And many of them have resulted in civil war, often very quickly. So the question is, what is it about these new states? What is it that happens when a new state is formed? And one kind of typical political science answer is to say, well, a state must emerge, and if a state doesn't emerge, you're going to have a disaster. But I also think you could say, by looking at the Irish experience, that what it is that happens when a new state is formed 
is that an internal enemy has to be found. Someone has to be defined as being now the internal enemy. And ultimately what happened in Ireland, I would say, is you had an external enemy, the British, from 1916 or 1919 to 1922, and then during the Civil War, the Republicans, the Republican movement and their supporters became defined as being the internal enemy. So there was this information war, this propaganda war, and I think territory and geography is very relevant because I think that this degree of, of physical dominance, this degree of territorial dominance, allow the government, for the most part, engage in that information war relatively successfully. Now, I should say, of course, that this is not, you know, when we look at these maps, that there are places in Ireland, of course, which were not um, dominated so easily by the National Army. We can talk about parts of Mayo, we can talk parts of Wexford. Kerry is another example. I have a quote here from an army report from late April 1923, so you know, really just a month or within a month of the ending of the Civil War, and the army were planning a, a big maneuver down in West Cork and Kerry, and this is what the report said. The West Cork and South Kerry area has always been very difficult to deal with, and these areas were an irregular stronghold from the very beginning of hostilities. Columns from time to time have penetrated into the area, but the district was so difficult to handle from any of our posts surrounding it that very little could be done without close cooperation between the Cork and Kerry demand. The need for a big operation was apparent for some time past, but owing to the necessity for attention to other areas, this cooperation could not be carried out until last week. So that part of Kerry remained resistance to the authority of the state for a very long time. Now this of course could be said of other parts of Ireland, I mentioned South Wexford earlier, but you could also say that to what extent did it really affect the overall picture? South Kerry or South Wexford or West Mayo are not necessarily strategically vital in terms of exerting power in the way I represented it on the map. Okay, so this brings me to the third approach, and I might spend more time on this particular approach, which is the way in which we can think of geography in terms of social geography. And this particular approach essentially poses the question of how geographical factors interact with social ones, like gender, class, land ownership, and religion. And I think this is a, a very important question one of the things I've noticed in terms of how the study of the Civil War has evolved during this decade of centenaries is that when I was writing my book in 2005, really most things that had been written about the Irish Civil War were seeing it as a military political split, looking at it largely from a top-down perspective and maybe not paying so much attention to how people actually experienced it on the ground. And I think one of the things that is developing now in terms of research as a consequence of events like this, but the decade of centenaries more generally, is we have a much broader view of what was going on in society than we did before. Now, one of the things I think this is important for is that we have to consider, going back to 1922, that a new state was being formed, but there was a great anxiety at the top as to whether the new state would succeed. There was anxiety about the virtues of the public. Were they democratic? Were they respecting of law and order? Would they pay their taxes? And the anxiety this took was, as a concrete object of anxiety, the fear of social revolution. And I think this is something that both the British government, who were interested in Ireland during the Civil War, and also the Dublin government, the provisional government, shared. Now, to give you an example of this, because I think this anxiety about the fear of the social fabric disraveling, it was very much projected onto rural Ireland. And a classic example of this is a letter 
written by Samuel Hoare, a member of the House of Commons, 21st of September 1922. He was acting as an unofficial advisor on Irish affairs to the cabinet. And this is what he said, and don't forget that throughout this period, there are so many commentators who are very doubtful that the Irish or the provisional government were made of sufficient metal, sufficient metal, that they would actually really take on and defeat the IRA. But this is what Hoare, this is what Hoare prophesied for the future of the provisional government. But if the provisional government is to be a real government, its writ must run outside the boundaries of the capital. All the information that I could obtain went to show that in the South and West, particularly in West Cork and Kerry, the state of the country is getting worse and not better. Moreover, in these districts, the irregulars can play upon the inflammable material of agrarian discontent. Refugees from Kerry, where it should be remembered, Childers is installed, declare that the country is in the hands of a peasant revolt and that the revolt is not being led by the young men who form the background of the irregular movement in these districts, but by the older men who remember the agrarian movements of the last generation. Unless the provisional government can stop that the landslide that is going on, the south and the southwest, with Cork at its centre, will drift either into complete anarchy or into a peasant republic. And the provisional government will not have the least chance of stopping the landslide if they have not sufficient men in the Free State Army. So that's an example of the way in which this fear of social revolution, which in the British elite is very much influenced by the spread of Bolshevism south and west after the Russian Revolution of 1917. Ireland could be another example of that. The provisional government, of course, are known as the pro-treaty government. But you must remember that the pro-treaty cause had essentially three elements during the Civil War. There was the idea that the treaty itself was a damn good bargain, a stepping stone to greater freedom, potentially reconciliation with Northern Ireland, the Boundary Commission, and so forth. Then there was a stronger argument to say that the anti-treatyites were essentially undemocratic, and because the majority of people wanted the treaty accepted, the war was basically fought by a democratic government. The cause of the treaty and the cause of Irish democracy were equivalent. But there's a third aspect of this which is very important, which is this fear of social revolution. This fear that the social customs, the civic culture of the Irish population is so weak and semi-criminal that really the social fabric could easily unravel unless we get on top. So this particular fear of social revolution, as I said, was projected onto rural Ireland during the Civil War. And even as late as February 1923, after a month in January where they executed 34 people, there was total alarm among certain members of the provisional government, namely William Cosgrave, Kevin O'Shiel, Kevin O'Higgins, who circulated memos to each other, basically trying to encourage each other to vote for really harsh countermeasures against people who were caught in the field. Summary executions, in other words. So this fear of social revolution, it never really went away. Now the question to answer is, what was it about rural Ireland that would lead to such fears, and why this fear of social revolution was projected onto the countryside? Social geography can be a very interesting way of explaining things like this in the context of a civil war. And it can also be a way of explaining why some counties during the civil war had one experience and others had a very different experience. And the first person to apply this perspective to Ireland and its revolution was actually a German sociologist called Erhard Rump, who later published a book called Nationalism and Socialism in 20th Century Ireland. Originally, it was just a PhD done in German. It's a really nice book, and it has a lot of maps 
This is not exactly a map I've taken from Rump, but it's a similar type of map. And you can see on this map that almost all the counties that are along the Atlantic seaboard, most of the counties that you would consider in the west of Ireland, have in the darkly shaded areas. In 1923, when there was an election in August after the Civil War, the Republican vote is over a third in all of them. That's probably a considerable underrepresentation of the strength of support for the anti-treatyites for various reasons. The Civil War had just ended, people were on the run, many people were in prison, they couldn't canvass, etc., etc., etc. But it raises the question of whether, in fact, there was underpinning the division over the treaty, some form of social discontent, and it was expressed in this kind of east-west terms. Now, Rump's contribution has been challenged, but one of the things I think he was getting to is this idea that, unlike the War of Independence, when people were kind of united against the British to a greater extent, the social fault lines of Irish society were revealed more by the Civil War. And the second thing he tried to suggest is that to understand these social fault lines, we had to think in East and West because it seemed as if the further you were away from Dublin, the stronger the anti-treaty sentiment. Someone said it this morning that people were attracted to, to anti-treaty Sinn Féin and the early Sinn Féin Fáil party because they didn't believe in the legitimacy of the state. But there could be other reasons. So Rump was, he was kind of getting at something about the social geography of Ireland. The book was written a long time ago, it's no longer very much in fashion. But he also mentioned Kerry five or six times in his book. And I just wonder what type of explanations he would give for why Kerry would have such a strong Republican movement, apart from the fact that the IRA was strong. And I suppose the first thing he would have said was that really location and isolation in itself may have been a factor. But then he says something maybe more interesting, which is a kind of psychological explanation, where he says that the small farmers of the West owe the preservation of their traditional Gaelic outlook to a remote situation and economic backwardness. They were, in a sense, sheltered from the worldly pressures which influenced other parts of the country to take a practical view. He also has a passage where he talks about land and the legacy of the decades and decades going back to the 1870s of land reform and the way in which, and I think this is true of counties beyond Kerry, the way in which during the Civil War people took advantage of the disorder to make claims on other people's lands and the way in which certain political differences may actually be traced back to jealousy and hostility to do with who got land. Now you've got to remember that land reform was decades and decades old by 1922. But when you think of what land reform actually was, was that it's a form of redistributing land to individual families. Once they get that land as an individual family, they have a legal title to that land. And since land reform was generally accepted as legitimate in rural Ireland, it's very hard to challenge it, either legally or politically. But maybe what Rump is trying to get to in terms of like his analysis of, of places like Kerry is this idea that there may have been people who took advantage of the chaos and the disorder and the violence of 1922-23 to actually, to actually basically fight over land in a way that was not possible in normal times. That's just a hypothesis, and I'm not an expert on Kerry. Um, I'm talking about geography, and this is one way in which social geographers would explain what happened in Ireland and try and explain this distribution of electoral support which you see on the screen. I've read different things. I, I read Owen O'Shea's very good book, No Middle Way, where it seemed as if the violence itself in Kerry was so brutal and so divisive that most people living in Kerry were forced to take sides. And don't forget that this 
map has also another interpretation, which is to say that the electoral pattern in a geographical sense in Ireland in the 1920s, and particularly in the early 1920s, is also for pro-treaty and anti-treaty parties to absolutely dominate electoral competition in the rural parts of Ireland. This wasn't true where I'm from, for example, in Wexford, where there's a strong Redmondite tradition, there's a very strong Labour tradition, there was a significant Protestant minority, and in that election, which was basically in June 16th, 1922, before the Civil War, basically the combined Sinn Féin vote was very, very short of maybe just a third of the vote. So, so the, electoral, the electoral history of Ireland can be complex, but this is one interpretation. And of course, Rump was writing in the 1950s. He doesn't have access to the brilliant army reports that many of us doing scholarship now on the Civil War can see. And one thing that stands out, and other people have mentioned it already, is that in the towns and villages of Kerry, it simply wasn't the case that the Free State Army was winning the information war, particularly blamed all the time in these army reports were the activities of Common Naman, which were basically the counter propaganda movement to the Free State during the Civil War. So Rump is old fashioned, but since I'm giving a lecture on the geography of the Irish Civil War, I should pay honor to someone who said that this might be an innovative way of looking at some of the regional differences and the regional tensions that were there in Ireland in 1922 and 1923. So in terms of concluding, all I want to say is in terms of geography is that normally when people talk about geography and the Irish Civil War, people comment on the limited opportunities provided by the terrain for any sustained insurgency. I agree with that, but we also have to consider the other factor, which is whether the geography of Ireland facilitated and enabled the successful expansion of the state and its broadcasting of its own power over space in 1922 and 1923. Liam Lynch, as we've heard earlier, was the chief of staff of the IRA, and he was very much concerned with the railway system. And again, in a communication from December 1922 to Kerry First Brigade, he noted that the army, because it could use the railways, was able to move troops around in large numbers very quickly. The IRA couldn't do that. They were stuck in their local areas. So what he was saying was to the Kerry First Brigade, really, we need to destroy we need to destroy the railway struck and the railways within a 50 mile radius of Dublin. This revealing comment he made is that is the enemy's principal base. And on that basis, they expanded and broadcast their own power. The second thing is more something that is relevant to my own discipline of political science because you probably know that in the United States, political science, the army, the government in Washington, they all tend to address the same problems and address the same solutions. And of course, they have to consider the evidence provided by Afghanistan, what is happening to Assad in Syria, you know, the disaster when they invaded Iraq, ongoing conflicts in places like Libya, and then of course Vietnam, where they got bogged down in a counterinsurgency operation which they couldn't win. They also, I think, think a lot about geography when it comes to conflict, because ultimately what's happened is they've ended up in places that are easy to, easy to occupy in a superficial way, but the insurgency always has time and space on its hand, and for the most part, counterinsurgency has failed. It didn't fail in Ireland, it succeeded almost hand down. It may have alienated a lot of people, but it did succeed. And so in political science, when we're talking about civil war, because so many civil wars take the form of long-term insurgency, you know, think of a country like Mozambique in the 1970s when it became independent, civil war began the next year, it lasted 15 years, it was horrific. Or consider a country like the Sudan that has been in perpetual civil war since the 1960s. Basically, the conditions favoring insurgency 
in those parts of the world also favoured civil war and they've suffered accordingly. In Ireland, I would argue because of the small size of the state essentially, and also because in the west of Ireland, it's not a natural compact periphery. Someone said earlier today, you can't call the kingdom part of the periphery, but I'm a political scientist, this is the language we use. Then there is the third conclusion, which is one thing I want to say because I talked about how I had written a book called The Politics of the Irish Civil War, and now I'm giving a lecture about the geography of the Irish Civil War. You can't really separate the two. Consider the question in the spring of 1922 of what Britain would have done if Michael Collins had gone over to de Valera's side. The British did not trust Collins. They didn't hate Collins, they hated de Valera, but they didn't trust Collins. And so they had to make exigency plans for how they would they deal with Ireland if this treaty process broke down. In March 1922, a technical subcommittee of the cabinet was asked to consider three scenarios. One was economic boycott. Two was economic blockade. And three was economic blockade accompanied by occupation of Dublin and certain cities. What the British were more likely to do was the latter. Interestingly, there was no plan to totally reoccupy Ireland, recognizing once again a theme that has been present in my lecture, even though I may not have openly expressed it, the difference between conquering urban Ireland and conquering rural Ireland. But nonetheless, those were the three scenarios. And it's quite interesting that when you think of the length of time the British had a very powerful empire, the different parts of the world that they conquered, they didn't always try and control the whole of the territory. Very often, you get to the capital city, you control the coastal ports, and then, of course, you control the sea. When it came to Dublin, they were also concerned with taxation, revenue, and so forth. But so were the provisional government. And when you think of actually what happened in geographical or territorial terms during the Civil War, the first thing was to get Dublin. The second thing was to use the sea to your advantage. And the third thing was to get control of all the towns and cities in the county, from which, of course, you could use your transport connections, you could collect taxation, and you could encourage trade. So in that sense, in terms of the geography of the Civil War, at least in terms of how the initial approach took place, the British and the Irish were largely on the same page. Thanks very much. Uh, brilliant. So we'll do the same format as before. Maybe we can get a microphone out here for um, Bill, and if you want to sit down, and we will. We have two people on either side. So if if you want to um, ask a question, just raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and yeah, we've got about 15 odd minutes for a question. So fire ahead. As, uh, this gentleman down here, the front row. Thank you, that was excellent, actually. Just, I'm interested in what impact or what role did the, the voting system, single transferable vote, as opposed to the first past the boat, post system, you know, the them and us, play in, I suppose, the successful continuation of the, the Irish Free State um, up to now, the 100 years of democracy, you know, and, and not going back into the violence that a them and us system actually portrays or, 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 or carries on. Thank you. Thanks for the question, because as a political scientist, I could answer it. <laughs> you know that, that the STV electoral system was actually devised by a professor of mathematics in Manchester. And the British PR society at the time wanted STV or some form of PR to be adapted in England, but ultimately was interested, introduced in Ireland. The first consequence we can see in terms of the Civil War that in June um, 
1922, rather than having two sides, you had 40% of the first preference vote going to Labour, Farmers, Independent Party. So it showed there was a pluralism in the society which was very, very strong. The second thing which people don't talk about, everyone will tell you that, oh, the pro-treatyites got 78% of the vote. This is kind of true if you include Labour, Farmers as pro-treaty votes. What it doesn't tell you is, what did people who are using the system we use nowadays, STV, where you can list and rank your preferences. How did they rank their preferences? And there's an interesting article by Michael Gallagher, who was a former professor in Trinity College Dublin, who did this research and showed that many anti-treaty voters were listing second and third preference votes for the pro-treatyites and vice versa. Maybe the vast majority of Sinn Féin voters didn't break the pact. So in that sense, in that sense, that was a vote for peace. That was the mandate for a civil war, if you interpret the second order, third order preferences. And then, of course, you had the, the situation which evolved then in the 1920s and 30s, where de Valera um, came to power. And for some reason, despite the fact that Fianna Fáil were in a majority, he didn't take the opportunity in 1937 to switch back to the British system, even though if he had done so, Fianna Fáil would have been in power practically permanently. So I think I agree with you that the STV system has served us very well. There was a referendum in the 50s, there was a referendum in the 60s on reverting back to the British system. That was um, defeated by the electorate, a very well-informed vote. And the last point I would make is because I'm, I'm living in the UK and I'm seeing what's going on with the politics there, that's not majority rule. That's a party that got a big minority, a plurality, converted into a majority of seats in the House of Commons, but a minority of a minority is actually running the country. So I think, like most small European democracies, we have an electoral system that we should be proud of. Well said. Anyone else? Well, can I take this opportunity? It's always great to be the, <laughs> to be the presenter for the keynote. Bill, look, you, your, your work has looked at Ireland, but you've looked at civil wars in, in, in general, globally. And I, again, I, you, you've mentioned this, but I'd like you to just drill down a little bit more. If I said to you, even talking about the ways of geography you were talking about today, if you put Ireland next to civil wars, you've other civil wars you studied outside of it. What stands out in terms of how Ireland fits into that broader story of civil war, but how does it stand out from that broader story as well? Have you any thoughts on that? It fits in in the sense that, you know, from the First World War, the Russian Revolution, to 1923, there were wars, revolutions, civil wars in so many places, the Balkans, Turkey, Central Europe, Scandinavia with Estonia, Latvia, Finland, there was an explosion of some kind of civil war. And Ireland fits in in the sense that, like many of these countries, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Hungary, we established a state and fought a civil war at the same time. So we fit into that pattern fairly well. But where we are different, I think, is that it was our civil war that we didn't have the Soviet Union attacking from the east, we didn't have the Germans attacking from the west. And this is true of the evolution of the state ever since, that we have faced certain existential crises to do with Northern Ireland and to do with economic policy and so forth. But ultimately, we are geopolitically in a very, very privileged place because it's only really Britain that we have to deal with. And one thing that's very important, I think, about this whole period is, you know, who was right in their estimation of what the treaty would bring? Was Michael Collins essentially right to think that they may have the governor general, they may have the oath, but ultimately, once the army goes, we have the power, and in any case, they're on their way out? Mm -hmm. So even if Britain is this elder brother and it remains in Northern Ireland, you know, basically, even when de Valera came to power in 1932, Britain acquiesced. Mm 
So I think ultimately there's a sense in which Michael Collins was right. And what was interesting to me about reading those um, contingency plans by this subcommittee in Britain, none of them actually involved reoccupying the whole of Ireland. Mm. And, you know, considering the fact that the treaty was accompanied in December by the threat of terrible and immediate war, does that mean that even by March that that had changed? Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, in the long run, the British public just lost interest in Irish affairs. So it could be that, unfortunately, Collins was right, but because of all the things that were coming with the treaty, which were in conflict with how people saw their own national identity, like being dominion status, crown as the mm -hmm. sovereign crown, the oath of allegiance. Collins was thinking militarily and realistically, mm -hmm. and I think he was quite accurate. I think ultimately Britain was on its way out yeah. of Southern Ireland. Anyone else? Oh, just John, down here. Hi, Bill. Um, the question is, this very interesting discussion of geography and the advantages conferred on the central government. Why didn't the British, therefore, win the War of Independence in the three years previously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It comes down to the question of legitimacy. And ultimately, Britain are fighting a, a kind of campaign where the majority of people have already expressed their votes in elections in 1918, then again in 1920. <coughs> and the IRA have the support of the population. But I think also you can't deny the fact that, you know, in terms of like the factors of power, the fact that the Catholic Church gave the moral legitimacy to the provisional point of view, the fact that um, it was so territorially dominant that really conceiving of any kind of alternative, <coughs> I don't know, but that, that's a very good question. But the other way of looking at this question is why did the IRA becomes so marginalized and inefficient during the Civil War compared to the War of Independence. Like, both of those questions are interrelated, but I agree it's a good question. <coughs> Sorry, I think Mary wants to make a point. I, Bill, thank you very much for that. That's <coughs> fascinating. Um, just look, if you're thinking back to your map, <coughs> and when I was looking at it, I thought, what it's doing is it's actually dividing the western seaboard from the rest of the country. And I wonder, you talk about social geography and how things intersect with that. Um, that is the, the poorest part of the country, the western seaboard. It's also the most Gaelic part of the country. I wonder, do those elements play into that <coughs> resistance, that idea that uh, you couldn't betray the ideal of the republic? It's also the last part of the country that was, a couple of centuries earlier, the last part conquered. Um, and the, those elements, those kind of inherited elements, the, the cultural elements, uh, and perhaps the, the poverty and the it's, it's small farmer territory, uh, small farms, smaller towns and cities. I mean, you don't have any, well, sorry, Cork, <coughs> but you don't have any major cities uh, other than maybe Cork and Galway uh, in that part of the country. Yeah, I think that that's what Rump was saying about the west of Ireland, that they were sheltered from certain pre pressures and they weren't connected into the international economy to the same extent. So they had that kind of psychological isolation. But what you're saying also <coughs> suggests that the dominance of Fianna Fáil over time was a reflection of that, that even though Fianna Fáil became popular in Dublin and their vote share went national, I suppose, in the 19. 27 election and so forth, that, that that was ultimately what it was based on. And I remember because Fianna Fáil, when they came to power in 1932, were quite willing to do things radically in economic policy. But then, you know, when you think of the 1937 constitution and where they were in 1938, where they were using red scare tactics against the Labour Party, they were able to shift from the supposed left to the kind of conservative right, but they still had the support. And one of the things in, in political science I find quite interesting and maybe even persuasive is that there's a UCD political scientist, Richard Sennett, who said that, you know, that the fact that people didn't compromise strengthened their identity over time. The fact that they were defeated meant that they could appeal to that constituency with more conviction. Whereas if you have compromised, 
and if you have bought into a set of symbols that are not particularly Irish, it's very hard to make that kind of appeal in the same way. So it seems as if what you're saying is that um, a certain kind of Irishness uh, was in the air in the west of Ireland, and it had a material underpinning, but it was also a psychological thing. And even if you look at some of these Ryark documentaries that were made in the 1960s and 70s about people from the west of Ireland who are emigrating to England and how many of them wanted to go back to Ireland to raise their families in the conditions that they themselves had reared. It's a very enduring kind of way of thinking, I think. So do you think there is an element of modernists versus traditionalists to an extent in the Civil War divide? Well, I, I mean, I think the, the modernism, I mean, Dermot Ferreter was talking about last night how the um, provisional government created a very centralized mm. state. And there's no doubt in my mind that for certain members of the provisional government, they saw the treaty and they saw the opportunity in the treaty to start reconstructing the economy and basically bringing business back to urban mm -hmm. Ireland. So I, I think that was there, whether you call it modernism yeah. or not, what it requires is a centralized state. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say the IRA were anarchists, but I must say that the way in which the local traditions of the IRA kicked in in certain mm -hmm. places, they, they behaved very much like anarchists would like an insurgency to behave. Mm -hmm. And they tried to destroy the functioning state. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say it was modernist versus traditionalist, but I would say that if you think of any new state, I mean, if you talk about developing education or talking about economic development or protecting your borders, mm -hmm. you're going to want a strong state. And whether the people who, who signed the treaty had that imperative before they signed the mm -hmm. treaty or they just stepped into that responsibility, that's ultimately what they did. And that is a very modern response to a civil war situation. That's as good a point as any right on time to finish. Can we thank again Dr. Bill Kassan?